to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number 337. Hello, welcome back to the Outdoor Station. You join us on the second part of the ultimate seasonal big day out, Bob and Andy's Christmas Party 2011. For those of you unaware what this is, it is usually where Andy and I go for a walk, a backpacking trip or similar, and we get to chew the fat, play with some outdoor toys and generally talk about outdoor stuff, which we think may be of interest to our listeners. Well, as it's December 2011 and the season of cheer and goodwill to all men, I thought we should make a big effort and go for a wild winter camp and see if we could cook a full three-course Christmas meal without using a single dehydrated item and record it for posterity for our ever-faithful listeners. In part one, we managed to cook and consume slow gin and mince pies, basil and tomato soup for starters, a full turkey meal with all the trimmings, while at the same time holding the tent down during a 60 mile an hour gale. Now we move on to pudding and the wild banter, which can only come after a fantastic meal and suitable refreshments. If you'd like to see more images and a full breakdown of gear and how I cooked this extravaganza, please visit the shiny new Outdoors Station website, where you can see all the information and leave comments and feedback on each podcast. So let us continue the story as pudding is served. And we move on to the wide range of topics we discuss as the Welsh weather thrashes the tent and we still question our mental state. I have to say, Bob, that to, that Christmas meal was not bad. And I've eaten many a Christmas meal in a pub for a work to do that was far inferior to that. And now we have the pièce de la résistance. It's Christmas pudding, homemade Christmas brandy butter. And what was that you just sprinkled on it? That was a bit of Rose's brandy that I pinched out of her Ooh, cupboard. So a I'm bit of hoping. Rose's medicinal supply. <laughs> yes. I'm yeah. just hoping that she it might will, miss that this evening. That will, it will light if I can get these matches to light. No. Yeah, I'll put the stove on. Yeah. Right. Oh, moment of... yeah. Will it light? Will it light? The brandy has infused the pudding. That's the it's trying it to. Oh, it's well, probably a bit too cold, actually. We probably just have to... Imagine. Imagine. Imagine flaming brandy. Oh, and a flaming tent. Right, there you go, sir. Okay, Christmas pudding. Christmas pudding it oh, is. Oh, look at that. Merry Wonderful. Christmas. Merry Christmas, one and all. Oh, dear. And is it still hot? That's the thing, because that's been in the, that pot um, cosy now for, what, 20 minutes, half an hour or so, or more? Yeah, it's warm. It's not boiling hot, but it's quite acceptable. In fact, those of you that are going for your work outing at the local Toby Inn or something, you'll probably have far worse Christmas pudding than this, I, I mm. guess. Yeah. yeah so well, it's already, the pudding is already cooked. All you're doing is heating it through, so... But st- steaming it slightly with that um, yeah. little trivet idea was good. Mm. I think this is a challenge actually for all all of those people that call themselves hikers and backpackers. Until they've had Christmas lunch out in the backcountry. Really, I think it's something everybody should try. Well, I'm surprised you haven't made it more of a personal challenge for um, for Humphrey. Well, you know, Humphrey is no- notorious for his four courses. He is, but, yeah. but you know, it's sort of de- of the dehydrated variety. We've actually cooked the meal. All the way through, yeah, from yeah. scratch, with real items. So, well, the only person that may have done it is Chris Townsend. I mean, as we speak, he may be up to six inches of snow on the Cairngorm platter, doing something interesting, but roasting a grouse. Mm. It is the grouse season, isn't it? You can kill them now. Actually, this is a... It's remarkable, isn't it, how the Christmas food, the tastes 
of all the different vegetables and the meat and whatever, do yeah. complement each other. Yeah, they do. To so finish yeah. off with a Christmas pudding like this and brandy, actually, is yeah. really, really nice. The brandy butter's lovely, Rose. Thank you very much. Yes, very good. Couldn't have done it without you. I was only joking earlier on, honest. I have to say, that's lovely. Well, don't do an Oliver on me, because there's no more. And that, um, that kick of brandy there is just fantastic. In fact, if this was the bloke from MasterChef, <laughs> he probably wanted to dive in there. Core, cool, mate, that's good. Core. Cool. We're looking to uh, develop some new stoves for next year. All samples are just arriving at the moment. Very excited about that. Um, but sadly, um, you didn't get the uh, the preview that you were hoping. Well, actually, last um, last week I did see some of the stoves, or at least I saw, saw some them. of the preview yeah, websites. The early samples. Yeah. Well, I have to say they're very interesting, and I Ooh. think those people who are avid collectors of um, lightweight stoves will find them useful. But um, I mean, I know because we talked about it you know, pretty continuously. It's taken you three or four years of not only designing the stoves but trying to source. The materials and trying to find the manufacturers who can do things in the right kind of way, and you finally cracked it. But it, it's taken an awful long time. That's been the, that's been the hardest part, um, and uh, it's been very enjoyable to meeting a lot of the, the characters. But it's uh, I think pretty well as a, a generalisation. You know, they're they're older people, you know, that are close to retirement that are running these traditional businesses with traditional skills, and they're um, retiring, and there's nobody else to take over. Um, that, the recession, the current financial situation um, and it's just so sad to see skills evaporating really which need to be um, need to be maintained and developed certainly I, I believe anyway Well Bob has sworn me to commercial confidentiality but I think I can say that probably next year by about the summer um, one of the most desired items will be the stove in the tin Well, that's very nice of you to say that's... Um, we are, Let's just leave it there. Let's just leave that hanging <laughs> in the yeah. lightweight ether. The, uh, but the, the most, well, there's two. There's that one and um, a wood gasifier. That's the most interesting one that's um, just Now, look, I mean, there. you do tend to do this because you're a technical person, unlike me, who's completely untechnical. But when you say a wood gasifier, do you mean a wood-burning stove? Or? Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, wood gas is... A gas which is given off from organic matter or wood, obviously primarily, just before it combusts. And if you mix that gas with warm air, it reburns, and it's it's a poisonous gas. The, the actual chemical breakdown, I, I can't. And is remember. that what gives you that kind of almost like turbocharged effect? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if yeah. you if you can get it burning blue, you're you are burning blue gas. I mean, it's yeah. not it's nothing new. It's just a. Um, it's just a, a technology, if you like, that's being put to one side. Because during the First World War and the Second World War, the, the old pictures you might have seen of uh, buses and lorries with a big bag on top of it was actually wood gas. And wood gas, as I understand it, can actually be piped into a um, combustion engine and replace petrol. Now, how it does that, I am not too sure. That's beyond my capabilities. But it's uh, interesting that as a, as a, um, a byproduct of burning organic matter, you can actually make the um, burning more efficient. Um, but just simply making a twin-walled uh, item uh, with from light material that's durable um, and made to a certain specification is remarkably difficult. I think we should say at the moment that there's been a bit of a, an upsurge in the last few years in people making kind of new versions of very very traditional um, dual skin wood burning stoves that have perhaps been employed in world wars and things like that but um, and you've taken that kind of principle and, and looked at it in a very novel way um, but it is very difficult to think that it's so difficult to find this stuff I mean you know once you find a company that can work in the materials you've got to be able to actually buy the materials itself and yeah. um, it's not easy to get hold of sheet titanium is it no, no, that, that in itself, titanium is, uh, is a virtually wow. unique product to get hold of in the UK. Um, is it still, is um, the market still dominated by the Chinese? Very much so. Yeah, very much so. Um, and I was talking to another manufacturer the other day uh, who makes uh, uh, clothing and, and, and um, travel apparel and, and bags and so on. 
and he was saying that he's struggling now for you know these plastic clips that you have that clip the rucksacks and your jacket together and whatever else the yeah, yeah, chest yeah, harness yeah. the small standard yeah half the inch, small standard yeah clips half inch one inch clips yeah. and all the rest of it he was saying his supplier he used to be able to uh, when he ran short pop down the road and within half an hour this is somebody in Manchester which is a big manufacturing area and uh, and and resupply and he's saying he is now in a situation that he's got to buy 10,000 units in from China to actually know that he's got enough stock to carry on making some of the products that he makes for people. It's, um, you know, the, the, the marketplace is changing very, very dramatically. And, and personally, I think the sooner we get back to, as, as a nation, manufacturing items and selling them rather than pushing money around on bits of paper, um, the, the better we will be. I think it's a shame, isn't it? Because we look at... Um you know, there are lots of niche, lightweight manufacturers around and, and they don't always survive that long. There are one or two that have made the transition to some kind of established business or international business. But, I mean, it's, doing it from the UK or Europe is very difficult. I mean, you know, I think you were telling me a couple of weeks ago that Dyneema, that, that kind of fabric that many of us use in packs now, it's almost impossible to purchase in the UK? No, you. The, I, I don't know of any manufacturer, there's certainly no manufacturer of it in the UK, and there's no um, wholesale supplier. Um, Dyneema is made either in Japan or in America, and the only way to get hold of Dyneema is to buy it um, in select lengths from certain suppliers in America, uh, which is frustrating. However, in this country, we do have um, Kevlar, which actually has very, very similar properties. Um, and it's something which uh, obviously we've heard all about as bulletproof vests and so on. And I've seen, I've got some Kevlar, and I've uh, I've seen uh, the material in practice, and actually it's very very similar. It's just that the Dyneema ripstop looks the business, and everybody's got used to it, you know. Yeah, well, maybe uh, maybe you'll turn your ingenious mind to something to do with that. Well, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, without breaking too many secrets. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing some of these stoves um, emerging in the next Well, you know, months. Andy, you will be the first person that, um, the first person that is uh, invited to the launch of these things. Now, I have to say that um, we've had our way through mince pies, tomato soup, full turkey dinner, Christmas puddings. And what now, about the Stilton and the port? That's what I said. Don't mock, don't mock. I couldn't, ah! I couldn't fit it in. <laughs> would you like a dash of whiskey to go with your, I would say your yeah. after eight mints? Now, as you know, I'm not really a You're whiskey You're not a whiskey person. drinker, but you drank plenty but, of mine on the TGO. <laughs> yeah, I'm making an exception for it when I'm trekking, yeah. Yeah, I certainly did. Nice 12-year-old Brook Laddie. Mm. Um, we have uh, after eight mints. I seem to recall we were sitting in the middle of the Feta Forest. That's indeed, that's right. Yeah, um, after eight mints, a... Um, Flavoured alcohol rum Ooh, um, so. barrel thing, and an, a, um, an almond dipped in chocolate. Oh, really to finish. Don't I don't know. I think we should leave the after eight to the end. When the man comes with the bill, I think, <laughs> I think we should have the after eight. Well, I, was, I, was gonna, I couldn't get the Ferrero Rocher in the box either, so um, you have to make do with these things. Oh, let's try one of these things. Ah. I want to do a long walk. So we're, you know, we all want to do long walks, but actually planning them and choosing them are difficult. So what's on the Bob Cartwright horizon then? Oh, well, I, I'm chatting to David Linton and his HRP. I, I really like the way that it sounded. Um, and uh, something like that, really. 500 miles would, would just do me nicely. Do it in a month or so. Um, yeah. What do I do? The whole sum of the HRP. Well, yeah, but it's that, you know, I've still got a business to run and mouths to feed and that sort of thing it's very hard I mean I fair play to David doing it it was obviously a, a considerable sacrifice on his part from an employment point of view being self-employed um, but it was also and I, I don't think David will mind us saying this because he's a nice guy but those kind of long treks are often life changing oh, he's come back and he's some, got himself a new job mm. which he starts in the New Year, I think, with the John Muir Trust. and I mean, it, that's one of the interesting things about long-distance treks. They are transformative. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I think I'm right in saying you got the idea for backpacking light.co.uk on a TGO challenge, didn't you? Yeah, that was right. For the first year I did it in um, 
it was the 25th year, so it was either 2004 or 2005, I think. The year of the brown hats. Um, yeah, but the, sorry, explain that. Well, you know the, the caps that people wear, that the brown, the light brown ones. Oh yeah, yeah. Caps. It's the, the 25 club. years. That's right. It was the 25th year. Anyway, well, you weren't there, Andy. I'm no, afraid. no. It was I, a year after you started. In fact, I'd never, I never, I hadn't really come across the two-year challenge. And one of the very first things that I saw about it was the PDF file that you produced on it. Oh yes, my epic trip. Which I think it's safe to say was not a lightweight thing. No, that was my epiphany. Yes. And yeah. uh, the uh, surrounded by people. What's this surrounded by people? I just kept bumping into the experienced ones, the wizened ones. That just had um at the time they just had a go like yes, gust. the ones you meet in the pub and they say, "Hello lads, did you miss the shortcut?" <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, those lovely people. Yes. The challenge. Sounds a good route, but I wouldn't go that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it is an epiphany moment. This thing about lightning your load and trekking. I mean, for me it was. I'm sure listeners have heard me say it before, but for me it was in the Pyrenees, an incredibly hot day, um, and I wasn't doing a backpacking holiday really. I mean, I was. Basing, basing campsites and doing day walks on the campsite and decided to move location and just do a couple of, you know, a couple of stages of the GR10, long distance footpath. And I remember climbing up over this very steep ridge, incredibly blistering sun, with this huge pack on my back, and throwing it down in disgust and thinking, I am never ever going to do this again. And I think a bit like you, a bit of Google searching and looking around and you realise... Actually, you're not the first person to that experience. come to that conclusion. Yeah. No, no, no. It's um, what I what I actually like about the whole um, lightweight epiphany generally, if you like, is you start to question everything. Um, we were saying on the way up here, you know, that, that you look, you go into. <laughs> that Rose is very nice, but she doesn't often wear a lot. <laughs> so right. Well, she carries a lot, so she's okay. Um, you, you, you start to look at every item you've got and actually, crit not criticise, but just sort of question, is it actually any use to you doing whatever it is you're doing? Um, and I think, uh, I think that's, a, that's a healthy thing to do. And what I've noticed going to the trade shows is that there's been a swing towards acknowledging lightweight as a, an ethos, but it's starting to swing back again. Yeah. And it's starting to get more clever and more... Well, we've lost a lot of the trade shows, haven't we? I mean, we yeah. have the... Outdoor show in Birmingham that we covered for many years, and that's now gone to the Exile Centre in London. And it was replaced last year by a, a somebody who tried to present an alternative, but actually they've not they've not made it to year two. And the XL show, while it's you know good in its own way, is really a kind of outdoor themed day out, isn't it? Climbing walls, kayaking things. Well, I think and many of us aren't going to make the trip to East London to do it, suddenly. No, I think um, one of the things that, gosh, this is the rain now. One of the things that we, we've said is that um, you, the audience that goes to the shows are split into two areas. There's the enthusiasts, the people, should we say, that we know that are like us, that are aware and they're looking for new products or whatever it might be. And there are those who have never experienced a climbing wall or never experienced a kayak or never experienced... Mm you know that sort of thing and for them the whole thing is is a real adventure so it can't be knocked it's good for to getting them into you know into the outdoors and awareness of, of what it can do for you but um it is a shame we're gonna have to work on some kind of alternative yeah it would be good you know if you go to one of these shows going to the cicerone stand for example meeting the team there meeting um some of their famous let me say more eccentric authors like paddy dylan Meeting somebody like Kev Reynolds. I can remember meeting Harvey's maps when they're down there. You know, it, it's a very nice thing to do, to actually meet the people behind some of these products, out, get people like that. It's very, very nice to meet them. Yeah, so uh, we're going to have to put our heads together and see if we can do something about that. Too. Excellent. Well, I think um, time has come up for uh, me to get the pots and pans ready for you to wash up. Um, push wash you up? In, What's that? Push you in the direction. <laughs> actually, <laughs> that wasn't... Totted on sandstone in my mo. <laughs> <laughs> that was the uh, remnants of my last five-day backpacking trip. Oh dear! Yeah, there could have been anything in that. And uh, yes, it's time to um, batten down the hatches. I think I thought it's got cold. Well, I think it's... we should do a time check. I mean, it, it feels as if it's half eleven at night. Yeah, it's uh, twenty to seven. Actually, it's getting on. It's getting on. Twenty to seven, way past my bedtime. Yeah. One of the things that's really nice about backpacking in the winter months. Is actually you do have a good night's sleep. Well, you can have a good night. Well, there's not a gale. Yeah, but yeah. But you have a good night's sleep. Bye, yeah. Yeah.
Anyway, listeners, I think that's our evening sorted. We're probably going to so. batten down the hatches now, as I say. Um, thank you very much for joining us on our Christmas notion. And uh, Christmas breakfast tomorrow, was it? So uh, yes. Scrambled eggs, smoked salmon. Um, I, I, a glass I, of champagne. Don't mock. It is fresh coffee and uh, pancakes. I've got my I've got my little poetry mate. Oh, Liddell. Oh, have you, you don't want any of my pancakes then? Oh yeah, yeah. If you oh, made your pancakes, oh, whoa. Oh. Right, in that case, you better clean the pan. It might be tempting fate a bit. But I mean, we actually haven't caused the fire in here yet, have we? It's, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's tempting fate. Yeah. But pancakes, yeah, another culinary experience. Pancakes and coffee tomorrow. Pancakes on the trail. Right, and then we can go for a walk and work off some of this, uh, this carbohydrate yeah, we've had but, tonight. But not too far, though. <laughs> Back to the car. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the award-winning UK Business Podcaster of the Year. The home of UK-based audio and video podcasts for lovers of the great outdoors everywhere. Podcasts are based solely around self-powered travel. This is the Outdoor Station. Good morning, listeners. Well... You join us after a very uh, interesting night, somewhat challenging weather-wise. Um, it dropped below zero as we found out by the ice outside our tents this morning. And the wind certainly came through in massive gusts at random times, uh, which resulted in me uh, having to suddenly grab the pole and keep an eye on the corners of the tent to see... Uh, if they moved or not, but thankfully the huge stones that we put down kept uh, kept both of them in good condition uh, and uh, up and upright. But of course, uh, like all these things, it doesn't give you a most comfortable night's sleep. But still, that's fine. And this morning, as promised, is um, I'm just going to crack an egg. Hang on, a little bit more. Beautiful. As promised, is a um, a pancake morning. And so I'm currently mixing up a supermarket pancake mix with one egg, which has survived the journey of my little egg container, and uh, 300 mils of water. And that's Andy passing wind there out of his uh, Neo Air as he s- sits back to watch the maestro in work. So I'm mixing this up in the little 900 pan. And then once I've got enough air into it, it's a lovely smooth mixture, which it appears to be now. These whisks are very useful, I have to say. I will drop it into the frying pan and very gingerly see if we can cook, say, four thick pancakes. Um, See how we get on on that score. But Andy is there transfixed, aren't you, Andy, by the maestro at work? Absolutely fascinated. I, I think that and my first thought was that actually you were using this trip to double up so we could do this on pancake day. Um, <laughs> but I expect all of these long distance hikers and trail walkers to be making pancakes every morning from work. Well, you know, I've been, um, I've been reading a few blogs um, that uh, people have done naturally um and uh i've also been reading some some of the old walking books yeah. as in people from the 30s and 40s that um that traveled and i do wonder you know the uh the, the dehydrated food has its place certainly there's no question however um i also think possibly doing some real cooking particularly if you're doing it you know over a meth stove or a wood stove where the fuel is slightly cheaper and a little bit more uh, if it's you know if it's correct in the environment you're in, why not yeah. do bannock bread or pancakes or, or whatever else you know? Absolutely. I think if you're um, in one of the warmer climates in a good part of the year, it makes a lot of sense. I'm not I'm not so sure I should be making a lot of pancakes when it's blowing a gale and pelting down the rain in the Scottish Highlands, but you know. Well. As I say, it's an environment. Of course, isn't it? It's an environment thing. Right, I'm just going to stop everything and then come back to you in a minute. This is a John Muir cart right here. (laughs) (laughs) It's Christmas time. 
It's Christmas time The season of peace Is finally here When family and friends And neighbors come to call Bringing love and Christmas cheer It's Christmas time it's Christmas time. Well, this is the big moment. There's a five pan and into it goes some pancake mix. Pancake mix. Oh, there's such lap of luxury. Did you sleep well last night? Uh, well, I was just saying earlier on, it was, uh, it was a bit nippy. And uh, there was an occasional gale where I grabbed the side of the tent and the... Um, and the pole, but um, everything held okay. Mm. But uh, it was it was fitful sleeping, I think, with the weather actually. It was cold, wasn't it? I yes, um, yes. I bought my winter sleeping bag, which is a wrap mm. bag, which is um, much heavier and uh, weighted down to minus five than my PhD minimus. But I think it's got colder spots in it. And I kind of felt it last night, and then looking up this morning, there was ice outside the outside the tent. So. Uh, yeah, I had um, I had my Rad 400 as well, which was a three-season bag, and I, I thought, oh, maybe I've it's lost some insulation, but I think it's exactly that. It's down to uh, it's cold. Yeah. Well, I have to say it's looking good. Yeah. I think the, I think the trick is, folks, if you're looking for pancakes for breakfast on a campsite, is look for a man wearing a Santa hat, and you never know. <laughs> You could be in luck. Indeedy. Well, these little uh, tools that I'm, I'm using are, are not necessarily um, specialist camping tools. They just happen to be small small items you can get in the... Um, Lidl. Lidl. Well, the Lidl and the sort of Lakeland of this yeah, world. Yeah, That's yeah. looking good. Now, this is the trick, is oh, to flip the pancake. Flip it over. And I haven't got a lot of room in a tent to flip a pancake. All right, how am I going to do this? I never thought about that bit. Uh, Nearly there. Yes. Oh, yes, look at that. Not a bad effort. I mean, obviously, you couldn't um, throw it in the air and yes. <laughs> toss it because uh, we don't have that much headroom. But that was a pretty good effort, that. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right, and actually, that one is going to be pretty crack on. Where's the plate? Let's have this plate here. Pop that in there, and you can be the uh, first subject. Actually, I haven't got my spork. I need a spork. No, it's not a spork job. This is a shove it in your mouth job. Shove it in your mouth. Real men's stuff. Man's food. Huckleberry Finn and all of that. I tried making uh, banana pancakes, which are really, really nice, but unfortunately the sugar that's in the banana tends yeah. to make a right mess of the frying pan, and it's yeah. a real devil. It's a shame. Because well, the problem with this, of course, is that you, you know, you're cooking everything on full belt, really. Um... Well, I, I have to disagree here, I'm afraid, Andy. It's got to be a gentle heat. That's why I keep moving it around. Yeah, but, I mean, it's difficult to get a gentle heat out of a gas. Oh, yeah, it? yeah. Well, they're designed to, really, designed to give you maximum heat as fast as possible because you want boiling water. Yeah. So, um, I'll get the edges done. Well, I think you've um, done pretty well on the pancake steaks, given the state of the equipment. It's a shame, really, we don't have some kind of smelly radio, isn't it? Because uh, last night, I still can't get over sitting there, the smell of those Brussels. I can smell them again this morning. For yeah, some so reason. could I, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've, right. I've made myself some coffee, and I could uh, porridge in my pot, and I could smell Brussels sprouts. There you go, then. There's your uh, Look. pancake. It's going to be piping hot, mine. So oh, yeah. I'll just start the next one. Oh, Dash of oil again. Move the oil around the pan. Pancake mix. Mm. Nice crisp exterior and uh, soft in the middle still, but uh, cooked. Is it cooked? That's the main thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, still cooking, but <laughs> fine. Yep, yeah, I definitely need to, uh, next time I do it with a bit more headroom so I can toss it properly. And we need a, and probably need to bring a little thing of maple syrup or something with us. Although that's going to be messy, isn't it? Well, I'm sure there's a container somewhere that will uh, have a little squidgy of, con of uh, 
Yeah, you're, you're on a small amount, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Or a bit of jam or something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, did, yeah. did the cranberry sauce last night in that tiny little cranberry pot. Cranberry sauce was gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. In fact, yeah. I had some left over. It'd be ideal with this. You mentioned bannock bread earlier, and that's something that is very successful, isn't it? That's very successful. You make that with virtually anything, actually. You can make, you know, you can cook it on a on any type of stove, wood stove, gas stove, whatever, and it comes in different forms. So you can, you know, bannock bread is just a basic um, mix of um, three parts self-raising flour to one part um, powdered milk, um, and you add enough water just to turn it into a, a paste, and then um, that's another one done. Um, you uh, can add, you know, chocolate to it, um, or sweet or savoury, whatever you wanted to do. It's uh, it's a, and, and you know, it breaks up the meal nicely as well. Certainly, uh, the few times I've done it, it's been on a wood-burning stove, and that's been great because you can just add it to whatever you're cooking. You know, if you're cooking um, a sort of a, a stew or a curry or something like that, then. Um, it just uh, gives you this yeah, something yeah. on the side. I mean, it's very filling as well, yeah. for not a vast amount of weight. To so be when fair. you were saying earlier about um, reading the books from the 20s and 30s, yeah, the old timers. I mean, in a sense, today we we kind of think of the long distance hiking and lightweight hiking fraternity and the bushcraft fraternity. But of course, they were really one and the same back in those days. Maybe. Those techniques were what you needed to survive. There was uh, most bushcraft folk today seem to park at the side of the road and toll into the woods, don't they? And, and just enjoy the camping side of it. Um, well, I think... So perhaps you bring the movement to bring the two back together again. Well, it's... Uh, yeah, I think it's... You know, a lot of it is, is, is I would describe as common sense, really, in the sense that, uh, you know, technology's moved on, everyone's gone to these sort of quick foods, dehydrated foods, um, uh, freeze-dried foods, you know, processed foods... Um, but then when you actually start looking at the amount of, of packaging you carry and the way these things are transported and the history well, of I mean them and all the rest of it. I mean, over the last five or six years particularly, the quality of dried food, backpacking dried food has improved no end. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's very expensive. Certainly, um, you know, a, a week-long trip can cost you the best part of 100 quid if you yeah. wanted two or three meals yeah. a day um, with two or three courses. So, you know... Two or three courses? Well, yeah, you have, you know, a, a, a starter and a, a main or a main and a put. Now it's back to Humphrey again, isn't it? <laughs> well, obviously, you know, you can see the standard I live to now. Now, it's... it's If you've got time to enjoy... I mean, the, the thing about backpacking generally is... I'm going to go, give this one a go. I'm going to try and toss this one. Here we go. Oh. Here we go. Magic moment. One, oh. two, three. Oh, oh, oh no. well, well, it left the pan. <laughs> and it left the pan again. Yeah, yes! Yes! Yeah. So I about to say, there wasn't quite enough height to flip it over, but you did it. I did it. I tossed my first pancake in a tent. <laughs> Another first. Oh, I tell you. This trip's made of them. Um... But I think I think it's it's common sense in the sense that um, a little bit of combination of real food, so say flour or, or or you know cooking items, don't weigh an awful lot more, but can vary the diet quite considerably. Um, I mean something as simple as you know you pass through a village, and if it's the time of year, you pass through a village and you buy some um, sweet corn, you know, and you can yeah. roast sweet corn as it's in the leaves, as it stands on top of virtually any stove, but a wood stove is quite nice. Yeah. You know, and there's part of your meal, you've eaten it, and it's organic, it goes back to nature. But also, there's no packaging involved as well. Yeah, well, I there's a lot of that these days. Probably. I mean, just in, in what we've brought this trip, I've got a, a, you know, a carrier bag there full of little plastic containers and plastic bags. And I do, I mean, this harumph moment, I do hate getting back from the supermarket and filling the bin with all the packaging ah. just to take the stuff and put yeah. it in the fridge. Oh, no. Right, do you want another one? I wouldn't say no, well, actually. There you go, then. There's a second pancake, one that's been personally tossed hey. by the maestro himself. Oh. Bit of oil. 
Now, I'm, just so that people are aware of this, what I'm doing is I'm to keep removing the pan from the heat because it does get very, very hot quickly. And uh, as Andy says, it's very difficult to control it. So I'm trying to cool the pan down every now and again. I think this might be the last one. Yep. Probably a thick one. I think it's going to be a thick one, yeah. That's for you. That's for the chef's burnt. Oh. So out of a pancake mix then on a titanium, what is it, seven inch pan or whatever, I've got four thickish pancakes as opposed to half a dozen thin ones. And a good time was had by all. Yeah, and see if we're going to be lucky with the weather. It was beautiful, as it often is early. Beautiful sunshine, and it's clouded over a little bit and looks a slightly more menacing, but I think the forecast is for it to remain dry today. Probably good, get a bit of a walk in. Perhaps as we head back, call into Hay on Wide. Do you fancy calling to the bookshops there? Oh, we need to do something. A bit of... I think there's a pub there as well, a bit actually. Of or two. Do you think they'll be serving Christmas dinner? <laughs> <laughs> we could compare. Should we go and give them notes? Oh, that's, that's Tips. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. you don't really don't need all of this stuff. good adventures to the hills it's obviously a natural conclusion to end it in a very nice pub particularly one with a roaring fire which we're sitting next to at the moment in the heart of Hay on Wye and Hay on Wye for many people will know is uh, the book capital of the of the country and they have the Hay Festival here it's a very charming esoteric sort of uh, alternative place but with a, a good backbone of appreciating outdoor people so there was no no comments, no raised eyebrows as we walked in with dirty shoes and trousers and soaked to the skin as it, as it rained this morning. But it's been a very pleasant couple of days and um, an enjoyable meal last night. We've just finished off with another one now. Oh, we certainly have. I think um, Bob knows I like books, so I think he decided that we'd go through Hay and Wine. But actually, we didn't really want a bookshop. We headed straight for the pub, <laughs> out of the hail. There's a beautiful fire here. I've got my tarox off and I'm uh, drying my smart wool socks in front of the fire and we just had, we didn't really want a great deal to eat because of Bob's superb meal the night before but we just had a ham sandwich and a bowl of chips and a nice pint of beer each yeah, the perfect way to finish I mean, we, it was nice this morning waking up, there'd been ice snow or hail or something during the night mm. there was a bit of snow up on the on the higher ground beautiful gentle winter light sunshine yeah not a bad way to finish off the year i don't think i think it was a very appropriate christmas party actually a nice uh, a nice meal is a, a very unique one and um, a very pleasant company and a, a good way to do it i think we should perhaps do it more often in fact rose did say something um, as she was watching me rush around gather all the various component parts to make this uh, make this event happen um, that I should finish off the uh, the piece by asking you to organise the next one and um, what would Im immediately come to mind for something in the new year with you? Yeah, yeah, let's do something else. I don't know where we'll go next time, I don't know. Well, let's, let's say, district. I'm, I'm going to be in your hands for your cooking and your location, how's that? Mm. Well, we won't be cooking Christmas lunch because it won't be Christmas. And there's presumably no fishing involved. Well, you can do the fishing if you want. But, um, there certainly won't be pancakes for breakfast. And maybe, maybe I'll let you do the pancakes. Because we did think this morning about how we could improve the pancake offering, the pancake recipe. But we'll have to look around. Maybe the North York Moors or something. Mm. Or, I don't know. Peak District gets a bit busy, doesn't it? But there are plenty of things for us to do and stumble around. But we must do it more often because, as everybody knows, I think, you know, even just getting out for one night under canvas, um, even if there's gale force winds, driving rain, as we had last night, it's still a great experience. You, you feel refreshed. So yeah, we must do that more often. You know, short break, uh, big treks are good, and short breaks are super. So uh, stay tuned for the next Bob and Andy's big day out, and we will see what Andy comes up with. But until next time, folks. Maybe Dartmoor. Maybe Dartmoor's okay, isn't it?
He's thinking now. You can tell. He's the, the, the cogs are turning. You can almost hear them. Nice pubs. With nice cosy fires in Dartmoor. <laughs> now, you're cooking, remember? Yeah. And didn't you just tell me you had a sister-in-law who's got a B&B in Brixham? <laughs> <laughs> so if all else fails... So, uh, so that's it from us. As you can hear, the, uh, the banter still continues, and we'll catch up with you next time. Take care now. Bye-bye. There, listeners, you heard it, you all heard it. Andy has taken up the gauntlet and is already thinking about where to go and possibly what to cook. My fingers are well and truly crossed. I can only hope it meets the standards and expectations of what has been set here in this podcast. The new Outdoor Station website, theoutdoorsstation.co.uk, is now up and running, and please do pop by and have a visit and a browse. There you will find images to go along with these two podcasts, along with more background information, and specifically more entertainment aimed at self-powered travellers, be they on foot, on wheels, or by sea. We have a wealth of new material to launch, and I'm hoping that 2012 will see the outdoor station become a vibrant resource for those needing a self-powered outdoor hit when you want it most. But finally, Andy and I and Rose and all those involved in the outdoor station would like to wish all our listeners around the world a very healthy, happy and safe Christmas break. Until next time and possibly next year, folks. Bye for now. Merry Christmas, baby. You sure did treat me nice. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To hear more from our extensive free library, please visit the website at theoutdoorstation.co.uk. You can now follow The Outdoor Station on Facebook, where we chat about each program we produce, answer questions, and discuss future productions. Why not join us there? This podcast is produced and hosted by theoutdoorstation.co.uk.